Welcome to the 13th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It is Wednesday the 22nd of May and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Tony and joining me this week is Laura. Hello. How are you Laura? I'm fine thank you. Good good good. Sadly neither Alan nor Mark can be here this week but we do have two excellent replacements. Uh, Laura Tchaikovsky. Hello, how are you doing? And Andy Piper. Hi there. Both uh, previous guest presenters on the Ubuntu UK podcast, but joining us for this season for the first time. Thank you for coming along, folks. Thank Glad you very to much. be here. Excellent. Well, we look forward to finding out your new, your views on the news that has happened in the recent days and weeks. Is that rhyme? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Shall we get on with the show? <laughs> <laughs> Harsh. <Probably for the best. laughs> okay. And it's time for some news. Uh, so the Ubuntu kernel team is going to be supporting the 3.8 version of the Linux kernel until August 2014. That's very generous of them. What's made them do a silly thing like that? I'm not quite sure. I think that's when something goes out of support. 13.04 goes out of support. Yes. But the... it's being used somewhere else. It's being used somewhere else. I was hoping somebody else had read this as well. Oh, okay. Well, basically, the, <laughs> the Ubuntu kernel team have taken on the burden of supporting the mainline Linux kernel, as it stands, oh. the proper Linus Torvalds anointed kernel, um, because that version, a 3.8, has been used in raring, yes. and therefore will have to be supported for 18 months anyway. So rather than just supporting it within Ubuntu, they said, well, we'll support it um, uh, in the main yeah. Linux kernel tree. That's kind of cool. I missed that yeah. part of it. Wow. Well, that's kind of the point of the story, really. That's why it's a more interesting <laughs> yeah. story than I thought. <laughs> yes, this is where it gets interesting. Pay attention, people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Do your homework. So Greg Crower hartman who's supposed to be maintaining it, has sort of said that he can't be bothered anymore. He's going to go off to do something else. So Canonical have stepped up to the plate, listening to the uh, the naysayers who say that Canonical don't con- contribute enough to the Linux kernel, um, and they're actually going to take on maintenance of the 3.8 series kernel. So, wow. Uh, because it's uh, not an active branch, it'll be security and bug and major bug fixes rather than significant developments. But um, it's still good. Um, do, we, do we have a, an applause sound effect or something to play in at this point, or kind of some kind of hip hip hooray? Oh, look at that! <laughs> kind of. Hooray! You have to add your own, own applause, I'm afraid, Andy. Um, but yeah, so that's quite interesting uh, that they're, they're stepping, up, stepping up to the plate to do that. And of course, other distributions will be able to take their work in the 3.8 kernel and reuse it should they wish. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Good news. Um, so the International Space Station is migrating its laptops from Windows to Linux. Yay! That's so cool. But can it, can will they be playing Space Odyssey like <gasps> Commander Hadfield did? In Probably. Space it it only so. took um, an incident back in 2008 when the space station got infected with um, a Windows virus to actually make them change. So I suggest we go everywhere and actually just get USBs and infect lots of things. So, so what, were they running, <laughs> what were they running on the International Space Station, this thing that is in orbit? Oh, Windows XP. Windows XP. Windows XP. How do they yeah. get updates? <laughs> <laughs> Slowly. <Yeah. laughs> why, why bother updating? It's the most stable Windows ever. Well, well, should... this, an astronaut took an infected USB stick up and plugged it in. It just seems it's like a mundane thing to do on the International Space Station. Well, well presumably that's how they were getting the updates. <laughs> yeah. It was via a USB stick in somebody's uh, <laughs> spacesuit pocket. Um, so they're going to be up. moving to Debian. Yes. In fact, so not the Debian version that's just been released, but the previous stable one, right? Debian 6. Which is Squeeze, I think. Or is it Wheezy? No, Wheezy is a brand new one, which is Oh, seven. okay. Oh. I, think, I think that's the same one that the Raspberry Pi distribution is based on at the moment, Wheezy. Uh, ah, cool. Okay. Just, you know, side point. Excellent. So, uh, I, anybody have any idea how many computers they have up there? Um, they've got loads. I think I've read this story um, that they've got like 20 or 30. I mean, there's only got like five or six people on the on the station, but they've got right. like 20 or 30 different computers and they've got like laptops floating around for them to just pick up and use whichever <laughs> module they're in. So Literally floating. Yeah, absolutely. Brings so, a new meaning to hot desking. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That was in a different story than the one we've, we've got linked here, but um, I'm sure I read that they've, they've got a surprisingly large number of, of uh, machines up there. Well, cool. I suppose it's not that surprising since you probably need a fair amount of 
well, technology to keep it in the, in the, in the sky. <laughs> in the air. <laughs> well, and they do scientific research and things like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. They, so you yeah. need laptops and stuff to drive all that. Um, I imagine that the space station is run by something more powerful than a Raspberry Pi, but I might be wrong. And the shuttle was run off a, effectively a less powerful thing than a desktop calculator. Oh, yeah, and if you go all the way back to the original space program, I mean, look at the, the, the machines that IBM used to help NASA back then. They were nothing compared to the today's standards, so it's mm. possible, mm. as long as you program it effectively. Absolutely. And not run Windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try and avoid Windows XP on your next space mission. <laughs> So uh, kernel versions uh, 2.6.37 or 37 to 3.8.9 have been found to be vulnerable to a local exploit, allowing access to almost any area of memory. So interesting, we were talking about version uh, kernel version 3.8 continuing to be maintained by the canonical team. Um, mm. So the bug itself um, was uh, fixed in April, um, but uh, unfortunately it was left in some of the older versions. Uh, and the Ubuntu kernel team have now released fixes for 12.04, 12 12.10, 12 and 13.04. Cool. So if there are updates pending on your system, it's probably worthwhile doing them. Well, let's advise getting those updates running because, uh, yeah, you don't want kernel bugs. That's they're generally not good. Yeah. So mm. a local exploit means that a, a user on your system could effectively get root access and then do anything to your system, I guess. That's the, that's the yeah, that's the kind of thing that they're talking about. Um, Interestingly, from a from a Linux kind of community perspective, the Red Hat kernels were were not affected because they do their own patches um, yeah. as they build them. Um, and I think Debian are still working on a fix. They may have released it by by now, but as we yeah. go to go to air. But uh, um, so yeah, there's there's been some nasty stuff happening there. So maybe the space station using Debian was not the best choice. They should have used Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't be the one to suggest that to them. Excellent. Okay, so Yahoo have purchased the purchased the photo blogging site Tumblr for one point one billion dollars. Um, so the Tumblr, that's a, Tumblr that's an, that's what we normally call an Instagram in the business, I think. <laughs> Tumblr users are absolutely happy and ecstatic about this. Um, Not so much, but I think. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I wasn't particularly bothered. And there's been a lot of stuff saying, you know, oh well, Tumblr's the new Geo Cities, which of course Yahoo also bought. <laughs> um, I actually noticed that the next day after the big thing on Monday and over the weekend, it was all rumoured that um, Yahoo also then updated Flickr and that's also yeah. caused lots of upset in the various communities. And Flickr as well as T Tumblr is a very community-driven and oriented site. So um, interesting stuff going on from Yahoo at the moment. Well, there were quite a lot of people expressing surprise that Yahoo still had $1.1 billion to uh, <laughs> spend on, on Tumblr. I didn't even realise was that that active still, to be honest. I mean... What, Yahoo I or Tumblr? <laughs> Yahoo. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, even when you see people's addresses on um, LinkedIn or other places, you kind of wonder, really, is that a Yahoo account? Uh, <laughs> it's a bit dubious. It's like a Hotmail account, really. AOL. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is quite retro, but as you say, you, you think of it as the early days of the web. You know, it was a great search engine or search directory. They had directories of websites. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, you know, from 10 plus 15 maybe <clears throat> years ago, um, but maybe less these days where... They just haven't got the uh, market integration. Is that a buzzword to use in this? Not, I mean, it's not just that. that. Google I mean, does. Once upon a time, the web relied on users to help to categorize where all the sites were. And as you say, Yahoo was one of those portals where you could go in and submit URLs and say this belongs to this particular category, you know, food, yeah. Mexican or something, you know, whereas now the, the search and spidering technology is much more effective that you don't necessarily need quite so much curation the algorithms uh, have become nearly become self-aware and skynet is nearly upon us <laughs> um but no i mean it's really interesting to see what marissa meyer's new goals are for yahoo now that she's kind of redirecting it and they've done a, they've released a lot of nice new mobile apps in the last few months oh, and they've right. started to integrate things like their new weather app uses pictures from Flickr of their of the city you're in or whatever city that it's describing. Cool. So, so they're, 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 you know, I'm not quite sure they've got a... I'm not sure that they've publicly expressed the vision yet, but certainly this is a really interesting building block and the, the idea that lots of young people in particular will use the Tumblr dashboard and, and gravitate towards Tumblr clearly kind of shows mm. where she's aiming to pick up eyeballs and, and, and views. Um Interesting. Uh, I'm a I'm a WordPress user, uh, and uh, Matt Mullenweg, the inventor of WordPress and uh, the guy that runs Automatic, which is the company that looks after WordPress, uh, wrote a blog post over the weekend before this had even been officially confirmed. I think over right. the weekend it was pretty clear that the deal was done. 
uh, and commented that you know normally they have maybe 400 to 600 posts per hour imported from the Tumblr blogs wow. um, and they'd gone up to a peak of 72,000 an hour. <laughs> um, this is posts, not blogs as a whole, right? right? So yeah. you know, they obviously have to individually grab posts and import them. But I mean, Yahoo are... I guess a safe pair of hands. They're not an uninspiring uh, necessarily pair of hands. There but... was a great story I read, um, which was called "What Happens After Your Company Is Taken Over by Yahoo." <laughs> really, um, which was you know it starts off with everybody both sides pat each other on the back and say yes, we really share the vision of each other, and this yeah. is all awesome. And within two years, when the golden handcuffs come off, um, the, the founders have left, and everything's kind of slow to a halt. So. Um, Again, this was old Yahoo, perhaps. I mean, particularly this was describing mm. things like um, who remembers sites like Upcoming and uh, oh God, yeah. Fire Eagle. No, it wasn't was it Fire Eagle? One, one of those. Um, uh, no, oh, gosh, I can't remember. Fire some, some, something. There was some. Yeah, there was some location thing, and uh, and they also bought. Then obviously they bought Flickr as their kind of major one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and you know the founders from Flickr moved on eventually, and. Uh, now they are revamping it, but it's taken them a long time. Yeah, so, so do you think this will be the kiss of death for it? Who knows? I mean, they haven't bought it to shut it down. Right, and, and they Facebook. Both, <laughs> they, they both both sides patted each other on the back and said, <laughs> yeah, we're going to remain independent and the team stays the same and we're not turning purple. And we're... I, I, I really liked, there were, there were a couple of things in David, I think David Carp, I think is the name of the guy that invented Tumblr, or one of the guys, and he posted that both companies have a... a, a, a a punctuation mark in their name so we're, wow. we're a great match that's synergy there yes <laughs> i know these things i saw a tweet last night from someone called benedict evans saying yahoo users are like the people who click on banner ads we know they must exist but we've never met one <laughs> <laughs> well i would particularly like that this deal was announced but using an animated gif yeah which it was the first time i've ever seen, seen a deal announced like that so are we are we we're officially calling them gifs are we not gifs I've always called them gifts. Yeah, yeah. Gif. always been We've a gif. all heard that today, have we? The uh, the uh, stuff about how you pronounce the word gif. The original creator insists that they should be called gifs. Really? Does he? Really? Yes. We should have spelt it with a J. I woke up to the to to a, a Twitter storm of uh, indignation that the inventor was wrong. And the correct <laughs> yeah. pronunciation was gif. I mean, we all know that gif's what you clean the hob with. Well, that's spelt with a J. This was, or in a fact, C. people were saying that you know this was a European rebrand mm. would be sif instead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Instead, so, um, <laughs> Mm, absolutely right laura um the h has been investigating reports the h it's a website the h online the h online oh that's, that's what, what i've completely yeah. missed that oh <laughs> yeah okay that place. i don't know that's what it's called okay it's been investigating reports that links posted in skype chats have been accessed by microsoft after their ascent i did see the story actually yeah so you're chatting on skype chat to somebody you mm -hmm. paste a link in it which you have to use now they've shut down msn and fab um, checks out what's in there no not fab not fab, fab doesn't uh... work from... <laughs> oh <laughs> fab's not there clicking on every link <laughs> that comes through on skype chat his job is possibly more fulfilling than that um <laughs> no basically if you're chatting on skype to somebody um and you paste a link into them and uh, it has to be an https link i believe yes oh okay an extra so. secure one yes. <laughs> so even if it's an internal url or something like that or it, and it contains potentially contains session information and cookie info you know in the yeah. stuff appended to the url which is kind of session related yeah some bot at microsoft will follow that link we'll go oh, there's a link i'm going to follow and let's see what's at the end of it um, and if it has got the session information that Andy was talking about in the URL, it may even be able to get into a protected system. If it's a badly written protected system, but yes. Yes, um, I agree. Um, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, it's not actually getting any content from the page. It's doing a, what they call a head request, which is getting server information back um, and getting a response from, from the web server that's serving the web page. And they had a reason for why they did this. They want to own all your data. No, they had a they had a reason that sort of excused it, even whether or not people are happy with that. It was to do with um, I don't know dodgy stuff going over the servers and checking that it wasn't or something. Like. Well, some of the speculation is that it's to do with the smart screen filter um, that's built into Internet Explorer, which is a like a phishing detection right, thing. Yeah. So they're checking out these websites to see if it's dodgy. Quite how you can do well, that for when you're for, for the users of Internet Explorer. Yeah, I see. Okay, good. that minority. <laughs> um, and how you can do that if you're not actually getting the page content back because the yeah. headers don't the head, the head request doesn't tell you anything particularly useful. Um, but nobody really knows, and nobody's particularly made a clear statement as far as we're aware yet about what that's all about. Probably find out it was some intern somewhere. <laughs> well, like a lot of these things, it's often something that was in, intent uh, was done with the best intentions, but wasn't necessarily executed in the best way. Mm. 
But yes, so there we go. Execute them. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, and that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates, or elevates you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. So, welcome to the community news. Um, Alejandra, the head of the web design for Ubuntu, has blogged about their re- the recent work to ensure Ubuntu.com website has access to all areas of the project, um, just including their projects and the products, not just community. Yes, so there's been a whole heap of work about rebranding the Ubuntu website at the moment. Is this kind of the some of the reasons behind it and some of the work that's gone into it? Yeah, so I think she was talking about the reasons why it actually happened, the plan for the future, because um, I know there was a lot of um, scepticism as why the, the link for community was actually removed off to Ubuntu.com. Mm. And she actually explained how the decision was made, what they actually did to make the change. So even as far as reaching out to myself um, to poke members of the Ubuntu UK team for hands-on user testing for them to come into canonical offices, she explained oh, cool. all of that, which wasn't possibly clear in other posts that were made um, because members of the community, I think, were kind of not believing what Canonical were saying, but kind of jumping to the Canonical have done something wrong, uproar kind of thing. And right. um, the blog post does kind of explain it an awful lot better. And uh, even following on from last week, when we had virtual UDS. The design team took part in it and good discussions were had. She says that there are two phases to the development of the site. So the first one is restructuring and updating Ubuntu.com to reflect the kind of the expanded scope of what Ubuntu is trying to do. So not just desktop and server, but all the tablet and phone and all the other devices that we might see coming along as well. So that's phase one, which has happened. And phase two, which is in progress now, is about adding the global navigation to all the key sites that are run under Ubuntu.com. So things like yeah. the wiki and I guess the forums and all the other sort of subdomains and things so that they all have a consistent navigation, which is obviously is a lot more work than just one system because it's not just a website. Yeah, just, I suppose it can't all just be done in one go. I mean, yeah. you need to plan and, and think out and obviously it has to be done in, in, in sections. And I suppose that's where some of the issue and the confusion actually happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because Alan's not here, um, I thought I'd just insert a little snarky comment that, of course, he, phase three will be to remove all references to GNU and Linux from the website as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. That won't happen. Of course it won't happen. We know that. OK, so uh, another piece of community mm-hmm. news. Uh, Canonical and Dell are running a competition to win a very shiny and lovely Dell XPS 13 Ubuntu Edition Ultrabook, which is their uh, lovely developer edition, super thin um, Dell laptop. Okay, uh, sounds great. I'd like to enter. What do I have yeah, to do? How do you do it? Well. So, um, if you are um, traveling in the near future to a couple of countries, um, Russia or Ukraine, uh, then you just need to take a photo of one of the uh, billboards in those countries advertising Ubuntu. So okay. It's, it's open to everyone. Uh, who lives in Russia or Ukraine or is visiting there mm, for, for business purposes mm, or even maybe pleasure. And also, I mean, there's some pictures of the of the posters on, on billboards in the uh, in the announcement on fridge dot com. Yeah. Um, there is a uh, there are other prizes other than the uh, laptop. Uh, there are also a bundle of articles from the Ubuntu store, including the much prized Ubuntu Messenger bag. Okay. Uh, or uh, the third prize being the uh, hundred gigabyte Ubuntu One storage and music streaming for a year. Oh, that's not nice. too bad. Yeah. yeah. I particularly want the laptop. But it's probably not worth the plane for I, I to buy those, one. <laughs> those laptops are really nice. I want one. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, to be honest, it's probably it probably is cheaper to buy one than to get to fly to Russia or Ukraine, take a prize-winning I, photograph of a billboard. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Tony. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, make sure you come back in time for next week's show, <laughs> and you can tell us all about it and how it went. Um, brainstorm, Ubuntu Brainstorm, which we talked about in our first ever episode. Ever first episode. 
Ever first episode, first yes. First ever, even. Yes. Um, back in season one, episode one, we talked about this new fantastic thing called Ubuntu Brainstorm, which is going to allow people to submit really good ideas that would get voted up and marked popular, and they would then maybe appear in an Ubuntu desktop near you at some point, sometime or, in the future. Or, well, at the time, desktop, but of course, these days, it could be any kind of device. That was a future we didn't even envisage oh, back in those dim and distant days. Um, <laughs> but it's been shut down now. So what happens instead? So nobody has any say or gets to put forward any ideas ever again. <laughs> you you are you are trolling I'm nicely sorry. this evening. I, I, I just, you know, Alan's not, Alan's not here to get sensitive and defend himself. So, <laughs> but I am. Oh, yeah. You're sitting next to Laura. You still have a canonical employee in the room. Yeah, I'm just out of arm's reach of her at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, basically, there isn't really a great place for ideas to go, but Ubuntu Brainstorm wasn't working in its current form, which is ah. why they've shut it down. Okay. There were there were not enough people to police it. There were not enough people to mark duplicate ideas and to merge them. I think I remember Alan doing some of that admin back in the early days anyway, and obviously, you know, a long time has moved in the last five years, and, uh, and people have moved on and lost interest. Um, plus, ideas weren't getting then absorbed into the Ubuntu development plan, the direction of Ubuntu has changed so much recently that yeah. it's kind of, for right, uh, rightly or wrongly, it is much more centrally led in terms of the direction of the project, I think, than it perhaps it was five years ago. So all things must pass, but not this podcast. We carry on. Ubuntu Six Brainstorm years. is no more. So the internet's John R. Bacon has published a roundup of what happened at the recent UDS. Okay. What did happen at the recent UDS? Laura, were you involved with UDS? Um, I managed to get catch up with one or two sessions. Um, it was very interesting having it online. They increased the length of the virtual UDS from two days to three days and increased the length of hours that it actually ran. So I think more people got to get involved. Um, quite a lot of discussions were had. So including the, the Ubuntu.com community link was discussed and um, lots of plans were made for the coming cycle. Yeah. Were you involved in any of the women's uh, Ubuntu thing? No, unfortunately, Liz and Sherry and a few others were there, um, but just other commitments meant I couldn't make it. But there does seem the the benefit for not actually um, for missing them uh, means you can actually still catch up with them online because they're all recorded. Ah, uh, brilliant. Well, one of the things that may pique people's interest is that there was interest ex- expressed at a UDS about moving to Chromium as the default browser mm. uh, on ubuntu to be honest personally i use chromium as my default browser anyway so one of the things i noticed uh, i just upgraded to raring and um i started playing around with and i hadn't played i know that this feature's been there for a while with the web apps that you can install into um into unity and i don't think that works with chromium does it is it dependent on a firefox feature? um i don't know i th- i'm not quite sure how the web apps work i think they're sandboxed aren't they they or, pop up or? when you when you go to a page in firefox which is a default then it's right. uh, and it's one of the ones that features it features it. it says would you like to install this app into and it pops up into unity but um i haven't seen it working with um chromium and, and chrome so i'm wondering if that move would entail a load of additional rework on those other things but i don't know Okay. One of the things that Jono mentions is that they're trying to get a preview of Ubuntu, rate, uh, Ubuntu 8, which is the Fablet UI, running on Mir as an optional um, thing going on there. So it'll be interesting to see the tablet work kind of taking the next step. Um, there are quite a lot of community discussions as well. Jono likes to write about those because I guess that's his job. Um, they were talking about um, approving uh, loco teams. Um, so the idea is that, oh, sorry, not approving loco teams. Sorry. So there will not be approved loco teams anymore. No. That's correct. Correct. There will be teams and we've changed the name because I'm on the local council and that was something that we worked on for the last cycle. Um, We just have a blog post to actually come out with it tomorrow at some point in time. Um, They're all going to be loco teams and then there will be some that will be verified. Okay. And that just is a short process uh, where we'll just make sure that they're up and running and they are a loco team. But they won't have. Yeah, they they are active. They won't have to go through the uh, reapproval stage or approval stage every two years. So... What's the th- reasoning behind that change? Um, a lot of people found it kind of disheartening if they weren't an approved team anymore. Um, if they had gone through the approval process and, you know, two years later, if they come to the local council and shown they possibly weren't as in a- as active as they were two years ago. Or, you know, sometimes just people go through different phases of a team. It may not be running events or it might be just activity on the mailing list. Um, and certain people found that kind of disheartening. Um to hear they weren't an approved right. logo team. 
So it was just, I think it's just a word, it's a terminology. There still are loco teams, but sometimes a word can actually mean more than what it is to some people. Hmm, I guess so. I mean, it's useful to know what's... Because there's nothing stopping anybody setting up a loco team. So we have a UK loco team, but somebody even within the UK could set up their own separate loco team if they wanted to do, but it couldn't be a verified team. Yeah, what? because every the, currently um, loco teams are countrywide in Europe, except for in the States. Again, this is something that we're actually working on to see if we can actually reduce that for the larger countries and make them into like provinces or states just like the States is. Um, and then have a city contact. This will all be displayed on loco.ubuntu.com, which is the website where you can see any loco team worldwide. And I think we have over 170 of them currently. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good. It's nice to hear that there's um, developments in that regard. Hopefully to make things a bit easier for people. What's the next story? Andy? The next story is that um, they have announced now that the Ubuntu SDK, which is the uh, single SDK, which is going to be the one targeting uh, all devices, including the phones and tablets, uh, is hopefully going to be ready by October time. So uh, around about the time that uh, Saucy Salamander, I've yeah. got it right, haven't I? Uh, the, next, the next version of Ubuntu 13, comes 10, up. Yeah. 13, 10. Bless um, you, Laura. <laughs> So the idea here is that this is going to be an all-in-one SDK, which lets you write cute applications with QML as the markup language for the for the user interface, and then okay. will seamlessly scale to any kind of device and look amazing. So this isn't just for the mobile apps, the phones, is tablets and potentially proper big PCs as well. I mean, that's what I understood from the interview a couple of episodes ago, right? With yeah, um, I remember it well. I, I remember it well as well. Uh, I remember listening to it. Um, so there's, there's going to be this this way of approaching app, app development for targeting the Ubuntu platform. Um, so the beta version of the SDK is due for de- de- release in July, and there's going to be some new widgets in there, so things like uh, menus for sharing content with social networks and uh, text search boxes and lots of other nice bits and pieces. Um, and then by October, hopefully, it will be baked so that people can start to build their cool apps for the uh, well for all the platforms, but also the Touch, the Ubuntu Touch platform. Excellent stuff. Shall we have some events then? Yes, tell us about events, Laura. So first up, we've got Random Hacks of Kindness in Southampton on the 1st and 2nd of June. Okay, so this was the kind of socially aware... Uh, we interviewed Dirk Gorison from the we project did. Um, earlier this season, I think, or maybe the end of last season. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's so a kind of socially aware hackathon where you get together and um, make something that will hopefully make the world slightly better for people in a kind way. So yeah, um, 1st and 2nd of June in Southampton. And we've got OrgCon on the 8th of June, um, and it will include some discussion about the Snoopers Charter and the right to be offensive online. So that's the Open Rights Group conference. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. A worthwhile talk. Now, the next thing is called something called Hack and Talk. I don't know. Is there anybody who could tell us about what that might involve? So um, that's my little conference that I've kind of set up here in the UK. Um, rather than going to an event once a year, I've tried... I'm trying to actually run an event every three to four months, a small on-conference style of event. Uh, I ran one in March and I'm running another one in June. And it's just a case where people can come along, give a short talk or demonst- demonstrate something that they're working on. Um, there's loads of space to actually work on projects. Uh, it's in the Google campus in London. Uh, we had about 40 people the last time in March and we had varying topics um, from how you document a free and open source event to education and open, uh, how to use open source in education. Um, it's not Ubuntu related, it's non-distro specific, it's non-language specific, so it is open to anybody and it would encourage people to actually come along. It is limited to 70 people, that's the only thing, just for space and to make sure everybody has um, enough space to actually sprawl out and work on their projects if needed. Brilliant. And this is the second one that you've done? It's the second one. I just came up with the idea just to um, have an event that reoccurs. And at the same time, if you want to learn about something and you're reading a blog post, it may not be clear. But if you see somebody demonstrate uh, an application or um, a tool, then people will actually get more involved. And I know Alan Bell actually helped a user just hands on how to use the HUD, um, which was quite which was the the idea of the whole thing is that if people can see people uh using the same tool that they've read about they actually will get more involved yeah okay cool cool. and that's the 29th of june yeah 
Okay, and Young Rewired State. Yes. Um, Andy, you want to tell us about yes, this? Yes, I took part in Young Rewired State. Right, really, there, there. Young Rewired State That's last year. Say. It is. Um, now, that happens in the middle of the summer holidays for children. So it's based, it's aimed at young people, um, I believe, aged between 8 and 18. And um, it happens across the UK. Uh, they spend a week, or well, Monday to Thursday, uh, working in centres around the UK with... Um, both people in the IT industry, the computer industry, and, and others who are prepared to mentor them and work with them. And the idea is that they get to um, hack on open data, which is government uh, and, and other data, cool. and build prototype websites and cool apps. Um, and then on the Friday, everybody goes converges on Birmingham uh, and uh, stays overnight. And then they uh, show on Saturday uh, and Sunday, they show their, their apps uh, and uh, get judged and stuff. So it's a really nice way for young people to learn about technology. It's not just open source. So they, you can choose what platform you, you want to use. Mm. Um, but it's a really it's a really good event to get involved in. And if you've got uh, youngsters in that age group, then there's lots of information on youngrewiredstate.org. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that, Andy. <laughs> Well, that's all for this episode. And join us next time when we'll be interviewing one Mr. Sean Tilly from Diaspora, reading your feedback and making your life a bit easier with some, what well, actually is going to be a webby love, not a command line love, a webby love. Ooh. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming along, Andy and Laura. Do you, do you fancy coming along for the next episode? Why not? That sounds like fun. I think, I think yeah. Mark and Alan will still be wandering around somewhere. So, yeah. <laughs> I think we can do, I, do I have to grow my hair like Mark? Yes, you've got one week. Okay. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.